Hi, this is uh, Bob from Hobby Concepts, and today I've got something a little bit different. I've been eyeballing this Tamiya Ford Bronco for a while and decided I needed one for myself. Now, I know on my channel I build some of my trucks, but hey, sometimes you just got to do something for you. So, I put this Bronco together, but I thought I may as well make a video while I'm doing it. So, I made a video of step-by-step -step assembly. If you're a novice and haven't built a Tamiya kit before, this should be a pretty good video for you. If you're a crawler expert, probably not. You don't need it. But I'm going to go through this step by step and build it. This is part one. It'll be the chassis. In part two, I'm going to paint and detail the body. Now, the real reason I wanted this kit was I'm going to install a buyer sound and light controller in it later. Um, and I will have a separate video on that. And that'll be for, for advanced users. But today, it's all about step-by-step -step building the Tamiya Bronco. It's a beautiful kit. It looks great. I can't afford the real thing, especially with the, uh, the way Ford dealers are right now with their crazy markups. But hey, this is great. It's inexpensive, and now I have the Bronco in my garage. So we're going to build this thing, chassis, part one. Let's get started. So the Tamiya Ford Bronco looks just awesome. I am... Uh, excited to build this and as I mentioned in the opening I'm going to to build it uh, step by step so if you haven't built an RC uh, vehicle before uh, this will be a great video for you I'm going to go through every little detail um, put it together a few suggested upgrades and that'll be two parts the first part will be building the chassis the second part will be painting the body and then I'm going to do a third part, and the third part will be for uh, basically more advanced, and that's going to be adding lights and digital sound using a buyer um, system computer board. So uh, anyway, three parts, chassis, body, and then updates. So I'm going to lay out these parts, and we will get started um, on this build. As we get started, let's take a quick look at the uh, instructions. So uh, to me, a instruction manual typically will have uh, some of the required options to build it in the front. So they're showing here a radio, uh, and they're showing you some of the tools you'll need. I'm gloss over that pretty quickly. But here's how the manuals are laid out. You can see a letter A here, and what that denotes is that there's a parts bag lettered A. And it'll have the parts in it required to complete the steps up until we see the letter B. And then we'll have a, a B bag. So pretty straightforward. The idea here is you don't want to open um, every bag to start with. Now I always use a dollar store muffin tin to sort my parts into. So I'll open bag A, dump the parts in here so I can find them. And that's how I get organized. The manuals are very, very good. They have a, a full-size drawing of each screw and nut and most of the parts required for that assembly. So if you're trying to figure out what MB5 is, you can just lay the screw right on the, on the uh, manual to, uh, to make sure it's the correct one. And then in the back of the manual, they have a layout of each parts tree. So you'll have a parts tree for example like this and they will show it on the manual here this is parts tree Q and then notice this part is highlighted in a different color which means they actually don't use that part in this kit. So great layout you can see a couple parts here that are on the trees they don't use in this kit and then all the contents of the parts bags A, B, C etc. are here in the back and on the very back are part numbers for a replacement part. So that's the manual. Let's talk about uh, the tools that we need to get this thing built. So the first thing are screwdrivers. Now these are Tamiya screwdrivers. This is the medium and the large screwdriver which I find just super good. They fit the Tamiya screws perfectly. Uh, you, you know you can use your own screwdriver um, but I like those. Or Tamiya makes an RC tool set currently on back order, it's been that way for a while, but it has um, it has both sizes of screwdrivers, it also has some nut drivers 
and they fit into this grippy handle. Um, I really like this tool set and use it a lot. So one or the other, if you need those, you need a pair of uh, side cutters that have a flush cut on one side. Um, you need a pair of needle nose pliers. Uh, you'll need a pair of tweezers. Now, maybe not necessarily required, but picking up some of these tiny parts from the bottom of a muffin tin, these things are awesome. Uh, these are curved tip Lexan scissors, and those are used to cut out the body. I use those a lot. So those are some of the tools you need. There'll probably be a couple other tools, and I'll hit those as I go along. Now, besides uh, what comes in the kit, there's a few other things you need. Parts bag A has got some grease, and it's got, to me, his little four-way spanner wrench, which is super handy. So you'll find those when you first open it up. You'll need a radio. So um, this is a, uh, a wheel radio. This happens to be a four-channel radio, link radio, which works real well. I've used this in some other vehicles. Or if you prefer, you can use a stick type radio as long as the left stick has a centering spring in it, which many radios you can modify to do that. Now I'll, I'll use the wheel radio when I build it initially, but I'll probably switch over to the um, 10 channel stick radio when I do part three because I'm going to do some pretty sophisticated sound and lighting and I need more channels and more knobs and functions to operate it. So we'll start out with the wheel radio. You'll need a battery. This is a typical 7.2 volt battery. You'll need a servo. I'm going to use a high-tech um, HS645 Metal Gear Ultra Torque servo for steering. This is a, a steering servo that's been around for a long time. Hard to argue with. Powerful, tough as nails. So we'll use that one in there. I am going to also change the motor. Um, the, the kit comes with a motor that's a Mabuchi motor that's been around for a hundred years. To me, it uses it in virtually every kit they make. Not necessarily the best kit for, or the best motor for the kit. So I'm going to replace it with a 55 turn motor that's better quality. Um, you can see that it has uh, cleanable and replaceable brushes, where this one does not and 55 turn motor has a lower top end speed and more torque which for this particular vehicle is going to be the way to go so I'm going to use that. The Tamiya kit also comes with a couple things that probably would be considered options. One of them is electronic speed control. This is a Hobbywing 1060. It's a great speed control. No need to change to anything fancier. Um, they work really good. It has forward and reverse. Um, it also comes with a basic lighting kit which I believe would give you headlights and brake lights, and that's probably about it. We'll investigate that, but I will, and I'll put it in to start with, but I will be replacing that later. So there's what we need to get started. I'm going to go ahead and lay out some parts. Oh, one other thing I'm going to be doing along the way is replacing the kit bushings with ball bearings. I always do this. Um, when we get to the first couple, I'll point them out but um, a ball bearing kit is appropriate. So let's dive into the instructions and get started building. So for step two here, I've laid out the parts that I need and I have verified that I have the correct shaft by laying it over the drawing. So this one, they call for a GB2, which is a 45 tooth gear. Now you can count the teeth, but Tamiya has molded in right here, it says 45T, right in the part. You won't be able to see it on camera, at least I don't think you will, but uh, that makes it pretty easy to identify. So we'll start the assembly by just putting this pin through and dropping it in to the gear like so. and then the pin will be held in by, by the, uh, the gear itself. Now they show a bushing 
on the end here. But we're going to replace those bushings with ball bearings. Now they show greasing the shaft, which if you're using the bushing, you want to grease that shaft. If you're using a ball bearing, you don't need to grease it. So that goes on like this. They want a bearing on the other side, but they want this 26 tooth gear on here first, so we're going to find that. Let's see here. That one says 26 teeth, and it has a another pin slot. So we're going to find another pin, drop it through the hole, put this one on here. Okay, and then they actually show the bearing on here first, and then a clip on the outside edge. There's a slot here for the clip. And we'll just use our needle nose pliers to clip that on. And there's our first assembly ready to go. The uh, next step has a couple different shafts. We can verify those here. And one thing you'll notice is that there's two different lengths of pins here. So we have to think about that. And both pins are shown here full size on the instructions, of course. So the first one we're going to look at is this MA-15 shaft and we're going to use the short pin and then this metal gear drops over it, pin fits in there and again we're using ball bearings so we don't need grease and that's that assembly like that and then this shaft right here has a snap ring that goes on first Now these are easy to launch across the room, so you want to be careful not to do that. And then we're going to put a pin through here and put this 20 tooth gear on over the slot. Looks like we get a bearing on each side. Like that. So there's our three assemblies right here move on to this one. This gray box down here is basically telling us you can you can swap these two gears um, depending on what gear ratio you want. So if you put the larger gear on this shaft and the smaller gear on this shaft, which is the way I have it set up, you'll have a lower gear ratio, which is what I want. You can go a higher gear ratio for top speed, lower gear ratio for lower speed, and then they refer you back to page 30 in the manual and there's a gear ratio chart here with the standard gears, the low gears and different pinions and you can see the final drive ratios so you can uh, adjust this kit to have the gear ratio that you want. So now we're going to move on to the transmission housing and that's this piece here and these are molded out of a, a glass filled nylon not plastic so they're super strong. Some of the other parts like this chassis part here is a, a glass filled plastic and then these, the shinier plastic, is actually just a, uh, a regular uh, injection molded plastic. So these parts are, are quite strong and very very nice. So I'm going to go ahead and clip those out and put this together. So I have the housings clipped out. One just thing to note is when you clip the parts away from the tree sometimes there's a little nub left and it's good practice to just trim that down. So this part right here, there's a capture nut that drops in on each side. And on one side, there's a washer. It fits in here and a screw that holds the capture nut. So we'll get that put in. And on the opposite side, a capture nut drops in, but there's nothing to hold it because when you put the two pieces together, the two halves of the transmission, 
the nut is held by the transmission. You just got to make sure it doesn't fall out while you're working on it. That goes in there like that. And now it's time to put these shafts in. So our first shaft goes like this. And since we have ball bearings, again, nothing's required to hook that in. Uh, except on these gears, we need to put some grease on them. So to me, it provides you with this white ceramic grease. You don't have to go crazy with it. But you want to coat the gears well. This one drops in here like that. Let's see how that works. And then a little more grease. Whoops. Ugh. on this gear. That's why I like building semi-trucks. Semi-trucks you can put the whole transmission together before you grease it. Keeps your fingers a lot cleaner. Okay, and then this one fits down in here. That's what it looks like. And then this cover just drops over it like this. And you can see that that nut will be captured by this. So um, because I don't want anything to fall apart, we will hold these up like this. Get everything to go down together. got to make sure that it it snaps down tight. You don't want to try and force it. I actually had a pin that, one of those cross pins that had slid out a little bit. It was just holding it apart. So I'm going to straighten that out. All right, everything seems smooth. So now I'll go ahead and install these screws that they show us. And most of them are We've got MA2, a little bit longer. So it's that screw right there, MA2. So those just mount in here, and we use our bigger size screwdriver. I'm going to put one in here. To hold it. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and install the rest of them. Notice that one of them is longer. So I'll get those in. Now we take um, this nylon piece and mount it against the gear with two screws. People ask me about using an electric screwdriver and I say, no, 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 don't even think about it. You want to be able to feel these screws. You don't have to tighten them super tight. You get them just snug and you're ready to go. And this drops over here, and one of our pins goes into it, and it only goes in from one direction. Line up the 
hole here. Like that. Now this should operate freely and it should turn the output shaft. You shouldn't feel any binding. If you do, take it apart and do it again. So now it's time to install the motor. I've got my, my hop-up motor, as I mentioned, a 55 turn motor. Actually a hop-down motor, lower speed. A little grub screw here and we're going to put some Loctite on it. Now Loctite you only use on metal to metal in these vehicles. You don't use it on plastic parts. Um, so this just mounts here. There's a flat on the shaft and it tells me to go 14 millimeters from the surface of the motor. So we're going to get that set. And right there. Now, there's a little bit of motor shaft sticking out here. Um, the Tamiya motor has a shorter shaft, but I already checked the fit, and the cover here does not hit the motor shaft, so we're in good shape. This uh, fiber ring mounts on here, and then we'll put a little bit of Loctite on the motor. Itself. and then we'll install it in the case. Now they use Allen screws to do that and to me it gives you an Allen wrench in the kit that fits these screws and they have a funky little washer that goes on them. So they mount like this. Now I'm actually going to go ahead and mount this, but then I'm going to show you how I adjust it when it's all mounted. So our motor's in here and you can see that it adjusts up and down so you can adjust the gear lash. Now I usually do this by feel, but an old trick, especially if you're just learning, is to put a little piece of typing paper in there. just mush the motor down on that tighten it up pull the piece of typing paper out and your gear lash is set really well um, that actually worked great and then I like to test with a single D battery and make sure everything's working the way it's supposed to. You can see that that works great. If a single D battery won't run it, then you're in trouble. Okay? So now it's time to go ahead and grease these gears and I'll just work some grease in there and spin it around until I get it all greased up. And then we'll move on to some of the frame. So here's the chassis parts. Uh, notice that there's some parts left over from the A-bag, a couple clips, a couple pins, of course the bushings that I didn't use, so there's always a few spare parts. This um, fits together like this, and the long screws go down into the, into the bottom frame. This are really complicated pieces. Um, to me it just does a great job of molding these things. So there's two screws here, these three screws mount, two of them mount here and here, and then this piece mounts up here like this with a little bit shorter screw. So I'll go ahead and screw this together. These pieces are pretty straightforward. This little um, ball uh, is a 
actually a, on a plastic parts tree. So this just assembles with the screw, the little ball, washer, drops through here, spacer, also from the plastic parts tree. And then it mounts in here. And this is the battery battery hold down. And you need three hands to do this. Okay, so I'll tighten that a bit. And then the other side is just the post, and it has a Phillips uh, screwdriver slot on the top. So I'll get those tightened up, and then that's just going to mount over there and clip in like this. The side frame pieces just mount on. You can't mount them backwards, they won't fit. This one has a, a little notch right here too that lines up with this side and MA2 screws hold it on here. So we'll just put this one side on here. And then up in the front, um, a couple of nuts drop in here, and there's a bolt, MB4, which looks like this one here probably, yes. And they just screw on here. Now, since this is metal to metal, I'm going to use thread lock on it. Actually, they only want the back one to start with. Like that. So we'll do the other side and then we'll come up and put on the ends. One last little thing before we move on to the next step. There's a, a nut that presses into the side of the frame right here. I know it's going to be hard to see. Just a friction fit. And then there's some more nuts that drop into these slots here. The only thing you have to be careful of is now once these are in here you don't want to flip it upside down. And then the next step is to build this assembly right here, which eventually will be the front shock towers and hold the servo. So this is the, uh, the front end and the servo mount. And now familiar, drop in the nut, and it bolts in like, like this. But you can also mount it like this if you want an upright servo. And in the instructions, you can flip back to the servo mounting area and see the laydown servo or the upright servo. So I'm going to mount mine in the laydown position, which is kind of their, their stock position. And again, I've got a metal-to-metal, uh, -metal, so I'm going to put some thread lock on this. And then this frame extension is actually going to be something like that on the frame when we do it. So it mounts mount through here, mounts through the third hole back. Like 
this. And then down inside they've got a, a little nut capture bracket. Put some thread lock on it. And we'll throw a nut in there. The other side builds the same. The rear actually builds the same except instead of a uh, servo mount it just has a uh, takes a little bit to get that nut in there um, it just has that, there we go a uh, little horseshoe bracket. So I'm going to go ahead and build the other side of that and build the rear one. So this front end, if you watched me assemble it, I actually had that turned around. So I fixed that. I can build semi-trucks with my eyes closed, but I've never built one of these. So that just slides over and then the long screw, remember there's a capture nut in those places again even though it has a lock washer. I'm going to use a little Loctite on it. And then the short one goes in the front. A lot of complicated pieces in here, but it really looks great. Okay, I'll tighten up the other side and then we'll do the back end. So the back end, um, there's just this bracket that mounts here on either side and there's a, uh, a spacer. It's the same piece we use to capture the nut but it's just going to slide in here and be a spacer. So um, I did assemble this piece with the cross member. So this is going to mount like this. I'm not even going to put the spacer in to start with. And this mounts over the top. And then these screws mount through here. We've got a capture nut in there. So I'm just going to loosely fit that. Then the spacer is going to slide down. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing. Go through the spacer into the capture net. Okay. And then do the opposite side the same way. And that will get our two shock towers front and rear end mounted. Time to mount our transmission. Now this, remember, has got uh, capture nuts in these four positions. So it just kind of wiggles into place here like that. And then screws from the bottom. And I'm going to thread lock on them. We'll put one in here. The parts fit is absolutely perfect. If you have to force anything with this kit, it's assembled wrong. So the other two screws in. Now we get to move on to the drive lines. You can see our our two drive shafts here on the bottom. 
really neat kit so far. Uh, our next step is to assemble these um, drive shafts. I put one together and installed it here. Um, it's <laughs> it's just a this little ball just mounts in here, and it's really just an exercise in wiggling and fitting. Um, this is where a pair of pliers comes in handy, but you have to put the pin in one side. I know this is going to be really hard to see on the video, but and then you just have to kind of work it down in. And pull this little tab up and get the ball underneath it. So there we go. See how that's up on there. And then I'll just pull it in until it drops in. And then there's our little ball in there. And then we do the same thing here um, with, with this coupler piece. And then this just slides over the shaft, and there's a there's a pin with a threaded head that slides in, and then you it goes through the hole in the shaft through both sides, and then just threads in. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble this one, and there's probably a few more of these since we have some more of these balls. So I'm not going to show the assembly of every one. But that is the theory, and needle nose pliers are mandatory. Um, the final step on the chassis is to mount these suspension mounts. And they, they have an offset. They're sloped towards the suspension end, so they just mount with a machine screw, a couple machine screws. And uh, Nothing exciting about that. I'm just going to start a screw here. A lot of screwing because the machine screws take forever to screw in. And then this, this piece mounts on the back. Same way. Machine screw. Which threads into the plastic. So, got a bunch of screws to put in. And then that will complete the chassis. And then we'll move on to the uh, axles. I have the uh, pieces laid out for the axles. So we've got a rear axle and then a front axle, a steering axle. And these two little pieces here can be used to lock the diff. So you can build the diffs open or locked. I'm going to lock the rear diff and leave the front diff open. So these are really straightforward to assemble. You just need a little bit of grease. We're going to do the, the open one first. And a little stainless ring fits on there. A little bit of grease in here. That drops in. Uh, same thing for the top one. A little bit of grease. The, the lock diff doesn't need any grease because it will not be moving internally. Okay, and that one's going to fit up in there. A little grease on these. I've built a lot of Tamiya diffs over the years. Pretty much all assemble the same. Sometimes I use a thicker grease in these diffs, but I don't really think it matters much in this vehicle grease in there, and this just drops in, grease on that one, grease on the ends of these, and then that just drops over the top, like that. And those pins line up in those holes, and then three screws will hold it together. The uh, screws need Loctite on them. On the rear diff, it's just the same. I'm actually going to put a couple drops of grease on 
on here just to hold the ring on. Same thing here. And then this piece then uh, drops in on top. You can see how that fits in there. Same thing here. We'll put a couple bits of grease on it just to hold this ring. Drop it in here and drop a diff lock in. On semi trucks, we lock diffs, we just use hot glue. These pieces then are not used. I will save those for later. And the same thing, three screws will hold it together with Loctite. So I'm building the front axle first, so I'm going to set aside the locked diff and the rear part so I don't mix them up. Um, here's one of the front axles, and you'll notice that I replaced the nylon bushings with ball bearings, so I don't need to grease the shaft. These are pretty straightforward. They just get a snap ring. Then we flip over to the next page, and now it's time to assemble the shaft for the spider gear. And that is a short shaft, like this one, also uses a snap ring. Now one little trick with these snap rings, you'll see that I put them on with uh, needle-nose pliers, but you can also shove it down on your bench. So whichever way works easier for you. And then this gets spider gear here. And it gets a ball bearing on this side. And then on this side, they give you a centered bronze bushing. Now, if you use the centered bronze bushing, you should grease the shaft. Um, I don't like these nylon bushings at all. Never would use them. These aren't too bad, but I'm going to replace that with a bearing. So I replace that with a ball bearing. Now the axles just fit in here. This axle has a pin that will actually be turning since we're using an open diff, so put a little grease on that. Slide that in separate these bearings and then this will just sit in here and it's important to get the bearings in the right place. There's a little bearing holder just like that. Then this drops in here like that. We need to grease those up and then our top will fit on. So this uses a whole bunch of um, just self-tapping screws to put it together. So I'm going to grease that. Get in there. So I've got that greased up. Now a couple things to look out for. First is there's a couple of capture nuts in here. To me, it is really liking the capture nuts on this kit. I have not seen that many on the kit before, but I like the way they work. So those need to be dropped in. The other thing is there's actually two different screws that are the same length but different diameters. So again, you can refer to the instructions and see which screw goes where. And then there's one longer screw. So with this all assembled, the longer screw fits back here. We'll get that in just so the axle doesn't come apart on me. Make sure it works. Yep, it's turning. Feels real good. Okay, and then we use the smaller screws here on the outside edges, way out there. 
and then the bigger screws mount in here. So I'll go ahead and uh, get this screwed together. And you got to be careful the axle shafts don't slide out because we don't have any thing to hold them on until we get the knuckles on. With the axle assembled, the next pieces that go on are these uh, uh, supports for the rods. And you'll notice that they're at an angle, and that's normal. Um, also, you'll notice, I'm going to just put a screw in one here just so it doesn't go away, um, that they have a little molded in letter. Uh, this one has a molded in A. And on the instructions, there's a letter A. So there's A, a B, a C, and a D. So that if you clip them off the parts tree, and you don't know which one goes where, uh, you can find the letter on the part. So two go on this side, and then two go on this side. And then these little balls screw into our capture nut. And because we're going into a metal-to-metal, -metal, we'll use a little Loctite. And those just thread in here. And you use the little Tamiya wrench to put those on. Like that. So I will mount the other two pieces and then these two will move on to the uh, knuckles. So I installed one steering knuckle and they're pretty straightforward. Uh, again, I replaced the the centered bronze bushing with a ball bearing and it just fits in exactly the same way but since it's a ball bearing again we don't need to really grease it and then this just put some grease on this ball end here and this just fits in and oh I like the sound. Sounds like an A-10 flying over. We got quite an A-10 squadron here in town. Uh, okay, so these shoulder screws hold it on. Get those tightened down. Again, just snug. Okay, so now there's a, a t great why don't work over carpet okay so there's a couple things there's a tie rod that holds the arms together and that's just a fixed piece and held in with a shoulder screw so put that on now I'm assuming then if you wanted to do some kind of hop-up, it would be nice to have an adjustable tie rod. I am not worried about that right at the moment. So we'll get this put together. And there's our there's our steering. Looks pretty good. Now the um, steering arm that goes to the servo has screw-on ends. And Tamiya does, in their typical wonderful Tamiya fashion, they have a full-size drawing of it here on the instruction sheet. So you just adjust it to match. And you'll notice that they're 90 degrees apart, and one end has one of these little plastic balls snapped into it. So we'll snap that in. Okay. And then that holds on with a screw and a shoulder piece right here. So I'll get that put together, and that that uh, finishes our front axle assembly. So uh, the suspension arms um, just mount 
the round one on the top and this cranked one on the bottom. Uh, one thing that I do with these is only cut out the ones I want because you can see the, the front arms are longer. So I don't want to mix them up so I just punch out what I'm using at the time. They have one of those plastic balls snapped in and they just fit in here and a machine screw holds them on. Now the machine screws screw right through the nylon but they take a lot of turns to put in. It's not like a self-tapping screw. You're messing with this screwdriver for a long time to get them in. So anyway, so I'll mount that one and I'll mount that one down here and then the the additional uh, drive shaft mounts with through this hole same way as the ones on the transmission the pin goes through and they just screw in no Loctite required because it's not metal to metal and these have got a uh, um, spline here that matches up to the spline on the transmission and that way as the suspension flexes this can move in and out and uh, those will slide together when I install the suspension so I'm going to put this other arm on and then our task is to build the rear axle. The uh, rear axle goes together the same as the front axle with a few exceptions one is that there's some spacers around the bearings. Uh, put a snap ring on this here. So there's a spacer and then the bearing and then another spacer and then another snap ring. And the reason for that I'll show you here in a second. is that when the axle lays in here you can see how the bearings fit and that keeps the axle from sliding out. Now on the front end it can't slide out because of the, the uh, hubs but on the back axles they need to be captured in both ends so they don't slide out. Everything else is the same. I'm going to grease this, put these together got two capture nuts, uh, the top fits on, same kind of screw assembly, the same brackets that hold the arms, the same arms. Uh, the only difference of course is there's no steering mechanism and even the same drive shaft part. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble this. So this is the part where it goes from being a bunch of parts to a a truck. So there's our front end all assembled and there's our rear end all assembled. Um, and these are the screws that hold it onto the chassis. So as I showed you earlier this just slides together and then these screws just mount through here and tighten up the assembly. So there's a bunch of screws. Um, there's one there, there's one down here at the bottom. And then there's a couple on the other side. Let me go ahead and throw those on. What that's going to do is attach our front end to the truck and the rear end is going to attach the same way. Tightening these all the way. I just want to get it kind of installed here so you can see it.
So there we go. There's our, our front end. This handles the pivoting suspension up and down so our shocks will mount in here and complete the assembly. So I've got to install the rear end the same way and I will go ahead and do that and we'll come back and build the shocks. So um, let's build a shock. Um, start out with you put a few drops of shock oil in the bottom here and two of these O-rings. A little bit more oil, kind of lube up those O-rings. And then this screws on, no tools are needed. You just screw it as tight as you can with your fingers. Then our shock shaft gets a spacer. There's a little bit of lube there. And then this drops through the O-rings. I hold it with a pair of needle nose pliers and then screw on the base. If you need a little extra torque, you, you shouldn't. It should screw on pretty easily. But if you do, you can put a, a screwdriver through it to turn it. Just don't over tighten and strip it out. And that gives us our, our shock. Now, um, I pour some shock oil in it and then work the piston up and down a little bit. Need my second thing of shock oil here. Work the piston up and down again. It's got slots on the sides, so you'll actually see some bubbles. Can't show them to you on video, but work it up and down until there's no more bubbles and then fill it up to the rim. Yeah, looks good. Then I put a piece of rag around it. Drop the rubber spacer on the top and screw down the top. Again, no tools needed off any shock oil. Feels pretty good. And our spring goes on. Spring collar fits on the bottom. And then they have us put a spacer on. Now they come with a couple different thicknesses of spacer or you can stack them to get the shock action you want. So I'm just going to go with the recommended shock action. So there's our shock. Very nice. Now to install it, you can see that I've installed um, the two back ones and one front one. So it just snaps over the ball this way here. So you can see it better. It just snaps over the ball on the bottom. I use a pair of pliers to, to grab it. Snap it. Okay. And then there's a, a bolt and a spacer that go up in the top here. Instructions show mounting it in the center hole, so that's what I'll do. Little tiny bit of Loctite here and a nut. There we go. So now you can see our, our suspension action and our flexing. Very flexible. chassis complete. So now it's time to uh, see here. 
the next thing they're going to talk to us about is setting up the radio. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and we'll get the, uh, the radio installed. It's starting to look like a truck. So before we install the servo, we need to set it up. And to me it provides this servo saver. There's three metal bands. You can see I put one on here already. Another one snaps on over that. Another one snaps over that. And then this assembly fits over the bands. This fits over that. And then it mounts on your servo. And they provide two different backs depending on what brand of servo you're using. The idea of the servo saver is it's a shock absorber. The little band flexes when this turns so it won't break the servo. Now in the early days of RC the servos had plastic gears and they were really very weak. So it was easy to break the gears if you hit something. Nowadays with <coughs> especially servos like this, high torque with metal gears, the servo saver is of little value. So you can decide if you want to use it or not. If you're using a inexpensive servo I would recommend it. But I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to use a, a completely solid servo arm. This came with the servo. It's a glass filled nylon, super strong. You can see I drilled the hole out so the, to me a ball will mount in there just fine. And before we mount it on the servo, get these out of the way, we need to center the servo up. And to do that, we plug the servo into the radio receiver and we plug the speed control that was included in the kit in the radio receiver. Got my radio here and I'll turn it on. And then when I power up the receiver, that will power up my servo. So um, now my steering turns it. So now it will be in the center and I can center up the arm as close as possible. Because the servo is spline, you see it's not perfectly 90 degrees, but most radios have a feature called sub trim that you can adjust that. So I'm going to mount this arm. Go ahead and just do that right now. So you can see it. And uh, Now you can see the steering and see how that works. And this radio has the capability to center the servo using a uh, sub trim, which I will do. And it also has the ability to dial how much steering I want. And I will adjust that when I install it in the truck. So now I'm going to bolt this on. I'm going to take this back off. I'm going to actually trim off the end of this with a uh, pair of clippers and just kind of sand it so it's nice and smooth. Then I'll put this assembly back together and then it'll be ready to mount in the truck. And it just slides into the front in this servo mounting location and then this arm will hook to it. So that's all there is to it as far as the steering goes. So let me get this put together and we'll get it in the truck. Zipping right along um, you can see I slid the servo in and held it in with two screws and my steering works just fine. So now they give you a side plates to mount here and here and I'll go ahead and mount this side plate and the speed control then just sticks down here with double sticky tape and the receiver they give you a little box somewhere in one of the parts trees. I don't have it here in front of me, but a little box to mount the receiver in the double sticky tapes down here. So I will go ahead and mount the receiver, mount this, and we're, we're zipping in on the end of the, the chassis build here. So I'm going to mount my little receiver box right here. I put some double stick tape on it. Don't let this stuff fool you. It's wickedly strong. Um, and then I same thing with the speed control, double stick tape. Stick it down over on this side. Now this particular speed control is waterproof. And then I'm going to use a small piece of um, double stick tape.
to tape down the switch. I don't normally ever use the switch. I just plug it in to turn it on and unplug it to turn it off. And then I'll, uh, so I'll mount the receiver in here, tie up the wiring. One more step on the chassis, and that's the bumpers. This front bumper is two pieces. It looks like you can adjust it forward and backwards. We're going to put the bumper in the forward position here. And that just screws together with three screws. I'm actually going to go ahead and do that. And it has the infamous by now capture nuts on the sides. The uh, you see the capture nut holders right there. Okay, and then this rear bumper, not really a bumper, it has a a bolt that goes through with a ball link on the end and it looks like to me it has borrowed a little Lego technology here. This uh, has places for capture nuts in it. Right here, but they're not using it. What they're doing is you slide the you pull this down and slide this in and then when this comes up it it's captured and that's the rear battery retainer so my assumption is you can pull this down slide this out slide your battery in from the back or you can pop the clip and slide your battery in from the front um, either way. So they've given you some flexibility in battery mounting. The front bumper now just slides in here and since we have a capture nut uses a bolt on either side to bolt it on. So I'll get, go ahead and bolt that on and then the final step that we're going to do here on the chassis is to uh, do the tires and wheels. Our final step is to assemble the tires, and those are really pretty straightforward. This just pulls on, and you'll have to pull the, the tire bead into the rim. It's just a matter of kind of working it around until you get it. that on the front, on the back, once you get that all worked into position, uh, you're going to want to glue the tires to the rim and that's to keep the tires from slipping while you got a lot of torque on them or peeling off. So. I just use a thin super glue and I pull the tire down to get a little gap there. And I just put one drop on each side here. Wipe off any extra. And then do the front edge. tires ready to go. I've already glued the other tires so now it's just mounting them and to mount them there's a there's a hole in the axle so we just put a pin through it and then this hex adapter has slots that capture the pin. The tire slides over it And then a lug nut goes on. So 
that takes care of the rear end. And then on the front, there's one final little part, and that's uh, that requires a bearing out here in the end. Now the bearing they give you, the bushing, is a different size than the other ones in the truck and it's denoted by a different color. It's gray instead of white. It's slightly larger. I am, of course, I'm going to replace it with a ball bearing, but it just presses into the carrier and then the wheel mounts the same way with a pin through it X adapter will grab the pin and the tire will mount on there. With the lug nut. Alright, so that completes my chassis. Looks good. Flex is good. I'll clean my bench off. We'll come back and do a few beauty shots of it. So there's our completed chassis. Went together really well. Um, you can see that I've got my, my radio here. Got my reverse. Forward. And uh, yeah, it operates well. Nice and clean. So that was pretty straightforward to build. We've got great flexibility in this chassis as far as um, wheel travel. I'm sure it'll be really fun to drive, especially on the dirt pile by my house. And I've got this Radio Link uh, two channel radio in it. So that completes uh, this first part, which was what I wanted to do, go through it step-by-step -step building. If you've never built a Tamiya kit before, this is a beautiful kit to start with. goes together well, has great parts, um, and we use two optional things, a bearing kit and a different motor. So now I'll be back in part two and we will do this body and we've got a lot of other parts. We've got you know, the body detailing parts, the roof rack, the chrome pieces, the light bit. So, um, I'll go through, you know, painting and detailing a Lexan body, which is different than any kind of plastic model you've ever seen. So, there you go. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Those help me with the uh, YouTube rankings. And uh, please subscribe to my channel. Mostly my channel is uh, 14th scale semi-truck stuff. Uh, and that's what I really do, but occasionally when I want to do something for myself, I'll drop in a different video. If you look back in my old, old videos, you'll see uh, one of the Tamiya um, Baja Bug builds that I did. And there's always a, a few little weird things on my channel. So anyway, uh, really appreciate watching. Uh, thanks again. We'll see you next time.